what, having you here, because I think a lot of people turn to those podcasts, average everyday people, not biochemists, turn to those podcasts looking for answers. And my hope is to give them some answers, particularly for this fat loss thing. And you alluded to this earlier, but for me, what it was, I've been in this kind of paleo diet for maybe seven years now, but it was only until um, I was so excited a couple months ago because you shared the work of Dr. Ted Naiman. And mm -hmm. I fell in love with his Instagram because it, I was like, yes, yes, I have something to share for people because what it really was for me was I did the keto thing. My, my niece was born having 300 seizures a day. And that's where I learned about keto was like for an actual therapeutic modality, mm -hmm. like what it was created mm -hmm. for. So I was doing blood draws and doing keto and all this stuff. Right. And I just couldn't break even as a, as a, as a power lifter, as a crossfitter, jujitsu, all these things. I couldn't break that like 13 to 15% body fat area until I discovered this concept of separating macronutrients into essentially two macros, energy and non-energy. And now I can maintain, you know, 11, 12% body fat, whatever effortlessly. So I really want to get into this with you because you're, you know, much more about it than I do. Um, the idea of protein, the protein leveraging hypothesis and how well this works for fat loss in particular. Yeah, it, it's interesting because we've gone through multiple cycles of demonizing different macronutrients, you know, so like fat was very demonized. And part of that was because we shifted out uh, like lard and butter in favor of hydrogenated vegetable oils. And that was a problem. And so there was a battle there. And then, you know, from from Atkins on forward, um, carbohydrates in various capacities have, have been kind of demonized. And then more recently, Protein's been demonized. And the funny thing yeah. about this is you can find these very fascinating camps. Um, the real extreme vegans, or just the kind of vegans in general, tend to be kind of protein phobic. But uh, you have like the 30 bananas a day vegan, you know, like Rob. Yeah. Then you have camps within keto land that recommend protein intakes that are lower than what you get from eating 30 bananas a day. So if, wow. you, it, 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 if you eat 30 bananas a day, you get about 40 grams of protein. Now, it's not complete proteins and all this type of stuff, but sure. you get about 40 grams of protein. There are doctors, dietitians, just internet personalities that are in the keto scene that recommend for a male my size, 30 grams of protein a day at, at infinitum. And now... So it's really interesting, and they're they're terrified of these things like mTOR and IGF one and, and and all this stuff. And, but it's fascinating that protein has become this thing that is super you know railed against, whether it's vegan or whether it's it's even elements within the keto scene. And what, what this protein leverage hypothesis puts forward is this idea that for virtually all organisms that creep crawl, move to get the, you know, that they don't use photosynthesis or, or something like that to, to, you know, sustain themselves that whether you're talking about a cow that's eating grass and clover or a, a more of a carnivorous or omnivorous animal in general, when you look at the food sources that that animal exploits, if it is higher protein content foods, it generally is also higher nutrient density foods. Yes. And so there are mechanisms within the body that largely track, it, it, our, our body has a sense of, of tracking overall caloric intake, but it also has a way of tracking basically protein intake as, as a baseline. So the, the body is both looking at protein as, a, as an input because it's giving a, an overall kind of like macro view of the total nutritional intake for the, for the critter. And then also in the background, it's looking at total caloric load. And it's generally using like fat mass and leptin and ghrelin and stuff like that to kind of manage these things. But it's kind of an input output management system. And then it's also looking at the vitamins, minerals, and micronutrients that would come along for the ride. And again, whether we're talking about herbivores or carnivores, in general, things that are higher in protein tend to have a higher nutrient density. And so you generally don't need to eat as much. And so within primates that have been studied in the story, when these primates, whether they're frugivorous or more of like a fermentive kind of gut bacteria kind of scenario, when these primates eat low protein diets, they eat more calories overall. Mm. Because they're effectively trying to hit 
that protein minimum so that they hit a nutritional minimum because their, their body knows that if they're not getting that, that protein allotment, that they're, they will be deficient in some sort of vitamin, mineral, micronutrient, or something like that. But whereas conversely, if they do pretty well on the, the protein intake, then the, the satiety signals tend to get fired rather quickly and you, you will very closely match you know, input and, and output. And so what we find is whether the individual is eating high carb or low carb, if the protein isn't adequate, the individual will have a tendency to overeat either the carbs or the fat or the fat carb combo. And, and right. so that's where the protein leverage hypothesis really, really comes in and is a, a very powerful. And it, it, it clears up a lot of this high carb versus low carb stuff. If you overlay a little bit of genetic individuality and like gut microbiota, you know, to help explain some of the, the individual responses to glycemic input, and then overlay that with this protein leverage hypothesis, you end up clearing up a lot of the confusion. Yeah, it's just the idea of, you know, forget about the macronutrient ratio, let's say, is it high fat, is it low fat, et cetera. It's the idea of eating whole foods and then protein satiety. And that's, that's what it was for me when I finally broke that little body fat deal that I, was, that I was struggling with was I just literally had to stop drinking fat and adding MCT oil right. to the meal. It was, it was that simple. Then it, right. be, it became effortless. You right. know? So I wish that people just could get a better understanding of that. But then you have the issue of fear. There's this fear-based thing. Like I had to do it. I do this weekly Facebook Live um, for my audience. And I had to do an entire 90-minute presentation because one of the first questions I get is like, oh, well, you're telling me to all eat all this protein. My kidneys are going to fail. And I'm right. like, oh, now we have to unpack that. And then there's right. the red meat causes cancer. And just there's so much nonsense that it's hard to convince people to eat all that meat, you know? Yeah, yeah. And this is like before we started recording, I, I mentioned that the, the vegan scene kind of has a little bit of an asymmetric warfare process going on, where they will just say, red meat causes cancer. Everybody right. knows that. And it sounds very credible. And association studies have per been presented as causal studies. Um, they're not well vetted for, you know, the fact that these are like diet recollection questionnaires and stuff like that. And so right. there's so many problems. But they'll say things like, red meat causes cancer. High protein intake will damage your kidneys. Um, uh, uh, cows are going to destroy the environment, you know? And these are soundbite statements that require a PhD dissertation to unpack them. Yeah. You know, and, and so there's really a, a remarkable asymmetric warfare that's going on there where um, these kind of more vegan-leaning folks are... are uh, able to make some really pretty specious and, and wild claims, but they sound very credible. Um, there is a lot of the orthodox mainstream that kind of embraces them. Um, there's a whole political divide that usually delineates these whole, these things. So it's very easy to slide into these, these uh, camps because it, it tends to go along with a certain kind of political orientation. And so it's, um, it's really fascinating. Like the UK just uh, proposed, and it was a, a vegan researcher backed by a, a, a vegan funded uh, research outlet that recommended that the UK enact a, a meat tax. Mm -hmm. And what's fascinating about this is that when you really dig into the data, the notion that it's going to save any lives is completely dubious. I mean, so incredibly dubious. But what it will absolutely do, getting back to this nutrient density story, it's going to reduce the protein intake that people already are probably short on, which is going to stimulate them to eat more of these problematic processed foods. And the ironic thing is the people that will be disproportionately impacted by this are the poor and minorities who are already Absolutely. not in a position to eat these highly nutrient dense foods. Yeah. And I, I did a, a brief post on my, my Facebook page with this the other day, but over the last century, the, the average IQ has, IQ is kind of a dodgy thing because they, they take the, the, the um, general intelligence at large and, and create a bell curve. And, and, but what, what they generally rank as intelligence has increased remarkably in the last hundred years. And they attribute most of this to improve dietary practices, like just preventing iodine deficiency in children and moms is attributable to like a 10 point increase in IQ. 
And, wow. and so it's really huge. And for the first time in history, the United States is seeing a decrease in average IQ because our, our, our dietary practices are so poor. So the first time in its history, we're, we're getting both shorter and arguably dumber. And the, the, <laughs> the most nutrient dense foods, the most likely to tick the boxes like EPA, DHA, iodine, vitamin D, these things that are critical for neurological development come, tend to come from these animal product sources. And we're suggesting that we're gonna make them even less accessible for the people who are farthest down the socioeconomic ladder. And so that, that is like, you know, with all this um, discussion around like equality and, and you, just all the stuff, which can get people into fistfights immediately, but yeah. folks are suggesting that we're going to make these most nutrient dense foods even more expensive, which is going, is that going to affect an a upper middle class or, or wealthy family? No, not at all. They're going to absorb that. But will that alter the dietary practices of a, a, a low income family, somebody that's living at the margin. Hell yes, it's gonna, it's gonna modify dietary practices. Yeah, man. Yeah. Well, and that's where you get into, uh, you know, I, we had this conversation at family dinner the other day because my whole family is kind of on board with living the same way that I do. But it's like, it's hard at that point when you start examining the evidence to not get a little tinfoil hat about this shit. You're like, wait a minute, what, what are we trying to do here? This is kind of crazy because. I think you and I talked about this a couple of years ago, Paleo FX, we, we touched on this and Mark Hyman's been talking about it recently. And I was like, whoa, because in the politically correct world, you gotta be really careful about this stuff. But you think, how do you think nutrition impacts crime rates? You know, right. it's like you have these, the, the lowest income neighborhoods where you might have a 14 year old kid who's never eaten a green vegetable in his life. And he's running around doing some stupid stuff that's gonna get him in trouble. It's like, wait a minute here, we need to connect these dots. It's incredibly important if, you, if your diet is soda, if you're a 12-year-old kid drinking 10 Dr. Peppers a day because it's cheap, because it's 99 cents at the grocery store or whatever, that's going to impact your brain in a significant way. So it's the, this whole foods idea, what people don't realize is if we're saying, hey, eat whole foods, what we're saying is eat more micronutrients. That's, yes. that's the argument, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, and it's a very contentious topic. But you know, yes. the 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 more vegan leaning scene, they will make the case that you know uh, fruits and vegetables are very very nutrient dense. That they're okay, but they they honestly really pale in comparison to meat products, particularly on on some like a folate deficiency early in life. You don't come back from that. Like the neurological impairment that a child will experience from that is is profound and and it, it it you can never fix it there's just a developmental window that will never be addressed and the it, it's it's interesting this gets really really controversial so you may or may not keep this you may cut it whatever but um uh if you do a little poking around and you try to it, you do some poking around uh infant death um, malnutrition mm -hmm. and you poke around on that very, very rarely, even in the most junkiest of junk food diets, so long as there's some animal products in the diet of the mom and the baby, you don't see death from nutrient deficiency. But you do see that very, very occasionally. But in, in uh, the vegan scene where uh, the mom's breast milk is so nutrient devoid that the babies have died, the, trying to feed the kids like a almond milk diet and stuff like that, the babies oh, have died. Man. Now these are very isolated inc incidences. Um, they've happened in Europe. There's been a, some instances in the United States, but it's interesting. You would think that these very um, marginalized at-risk populations, uh, you know, where like fast food restaurants are kind of, and corner markets are the mainstay for what, what they can get food from, you don't see massive amounts of, of like infant mortality from malnutrition. Now, and, and you probably see some other problems, but it's really interesting that even that very, very poor diet, even just like, you know, the, the processed meat is still nutrient dense enough to offset a bunch of these other problems. And again, this is a really mm -hmm. controversial topic. And like the, the treatment that I gave it there is really insufficient. Like it deserves like a, probably a two hour long, you know, podcast with some slides, you know, yeah. you know, unplugging all that stuff, but it's interesting. And again, um, the, the kind of sexy, um, 
politically viable stories around our food and food systems really paint animal products in a very poor light. And it, if that was, if that's the truth, then okay, let's follow the truth. But if it's inaccurate, if this stuff is being painted in an inaccurate fashion, we may have some massive ecological consequences, economic consequences, social consequences for just getting this story wrong about the way that we're fundamentally uh, raising food and, and you know, feeding ourselves. Yeah, for sure. The nutrient density thing too is something that, I mean, I forget about it. I think that, um, you know, lower income households forget about it too. It's like, to, I mean, you can go to the store and spend two bucks and get a big jug of chicken livers. <laughs> you know, it's like these, this organ meat thing too, if we're really going to focus on nutrient density, it's like, we're not saying that you got to eat three pounds of ground beef every right. day. You know, there, there, there's extremes to all this stuff. It's like, if you really want to just focus on nutrient density, you could be a vegan and well, a vegan, except eat some organ meats, you know, four, eight, 12 grams, whatever of organ meats every day, or even like oysters, things like that, that people don't right. even think about Yeah, you know, yeah. for that nutrient dense piece. So speaking of the nutrient density too, another, I've been dying to ask you about this, man. I actually sent you this question for one of your Rob and Nikki Q and A's. I like sent it to you on Instagram, right? Because I'm, I'm trying to get this piece of the puzzle just completely honed in and figured out. And that is total caloric intake. 